David, welcome to talk three of our talks on Gregory of Nyssa. Um, and in talks one and talks two, we went in some depth into first the Cappadocian fathers uh, and their contribution to Christian thought. Uh, then more specifically, Gregory and his um, amazing speculative theology where he, he, uh, which he, which he seemed very much to certainly in, on the making of men and on the soul and the resurrection grounded in the truth of creation and um, took that as his anchor point. But of course, for him, creation was not just, well, not was not an objectified thing-based cosmos. It was an anthropic system um, and and an anthropic system which uh, of which the incarnation made absolute sense and um, I don't think I mentioned it in the first discussion but long ago when I was talking about faith uh, actually at a wedding it was rather rambunctious and it was all very loud and there was a woman there who was inquisitive and a, and a, a high liver but had a deep yearning soul and I was sharing with her um, about the resurrection and my faith, which she was intrigued by, she knew about it. And she said something I've never forgotten. Um, uh, she's since passed away. But uh, she stopped and she paused and she said, you know, it sounds like Jesus has confirmed all that we suspected was true. And I really liked that. Uh, so I think that's Gregory's investigation. Okay. Uh, today, however, uh, we're going to move on to what I've colloquially entitled uh, why did the wrong guy win? Um, the wrong guy being Augustine and um, Augustine's influence uh, over the mind, uh, uh, the Christian mind, uh, seems to be the dominant influence. Obviously, that's a that's a hypothesis. But... Uh, well, in in the West, yeah. I mean, he he never really uh, though he's a saint in the Eastern Church. Uh, uh, he, he never really influenced the development of theology uh, in the East, but in the Latin speaking West, yeah, I mean, there's no figure other perhaps than St. Paul of, of, of comparable magnitude. And then even then, the Paul that most Christians, most Western Christians think they know is Augustine's Paul, you know. So arguably, uh, Western Christianity is with a few local exceptions and aberrations and eccentric uh, outliers, uh, Augustinian through and through. Well, given, given that caveat, which in itself would be interesting to explore, certainly um, uh, accepting that, I think I'm, let's, let's talk about Western Christianity. That's, that yeah. happens to be my tradition, um, which I'm to some extent escaping from. Um, but uh, let's, to, to parse this out, I mean, I, I think you have said certainly in Western Christianity was like a, a there's a, a de facto rivalry between the thought trajectory of Gregory and the thought trajectory of Augustine. That might simplify things, but but um, uh, nonetheless, um, the uh, we've gone down a certain. Let me let me summarise where I what, what I'm suspecting, which is Augustine has appealed to the dark side of the human psyche more often than not, and um, uh, okay, uh, um, the uh, here here and get myself ready for the winds of controversy. So, okay. Yeah, but, um, uh, and um, uh, um, in saying that, by the way, I. I mean, my my life, as you know, has been a, a, a life in consulting to large organisations, and I, I've I've had a front row seat at, at human caution, um, and I have noticed again and again and again how the natural psyche of the, of human beings, with the best of intentions, is fearful. It's 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 about ten times easier to make people frightened than it is to make them inspired. And, and, you know, and I see this in practice, in practice when people are confronting some innovation, some new way of doing things that even though everybody 
thinks is a good idea um, when it comes to actually committing to it, um, a, a slight uh, risk will be enough to kill it. Um, and, um, and so there's something in the human psyche that veers towards that. Any, anyway, that gives you perhaps just, that's just an entirely personal background as to the fact that um, any vision of blessedness is going to have a lot more trouble um, winning over than a vision that will emphasise some degree of caution, judgment, sin. Uh, uh, I, I should move on from that because that's really personal and you may not agree with it. But let me begin with Augustine. Uh, I don't want to, we cannot spend the whole time talking about Augustine, but he's He's clearly had a defining influence on modern Christianity, modern Western Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant. Perhaps you could give us a bit of a sketch, broad sketch of uh, Augustine. Um, you just quickly, you know, put him into some context for our well, listeners. Well, I mean, there's no uh, there's no figure in church history about whom more has been said, arguably. I mean, other than, of course, than. <laughs> Christ, if you put Christ in church history or Paul, but even then, I, I, I'm not sure uh, if, if we understand the history of the church as the post-apostolic institution uh, that, that gave us the doctrinal framework of, of later orthodoxy. Uh, Augustine towers over the Western half of the church, but uh, he, he, uh, he has no rival for eminence in the East in the sense that there's no single Eastern figure who's so pervasively influential of the whole Eastern tradition. So um, there are other great fathers, the great fathers of the East, but, and, but uh, the Western tradition after the, the early fifth century is uh, basically Augustine and a few footnotes. And so, you know, and the reason for this is not, is not hard to find if you've read Augustine. I mean, he uh, was a towering genius. I mean, this has to be understood. Um, uh, he was a master of rhetoric and there was a power of personality that uniquely he was able to impose uh, on later generations of Christian thinkers. I don't think there's any other theologian in church history who actually impressed his personality as well as his ideas on, on uh, vast portions of, of Christian life. And yet I think Augustine actually did that. Uh, he's one of the most original minds in Western history. Uh, either, depending on your temperament, one of the most attractive or, or the most disturbing personalities um, because we know more about his interior life and about his personality than we do of any other church father. Um, well, well, to that, can I just, uh, can I just um, respond to that? I mean, clearly his Confessions is an extraordinary book, could you say? And it's so, it, well, A, it's revealing, but B, it seems to me to be revealing of a, of a troubled, tormented soul. I mean, that's what makes it so interesting. Could you say a bit about that? The confession? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's an unprecedented book. There's nothing like it beforehand. Now, it's not a modern autobiography in the sense that it's actually not centered on, on the author in the way uh, a modern autobiography would be. It's all addressed directly to God. It's one long prayer. But it does venture into the interior life of the author in a way that had simply never been done before. I mean, it, it, it takes account of the changing passions and emotions, apprehensions. It, 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 uh, it's, it's one of the most open and revealing documents. The, well, not one of them, it is the most revealing document to come from antiquity, late antiquity or early antiquity or any, whatever antiquity you've got on sale. Uh, you know, uh, he simply, and it's not just in the confession. But let me let me step back a moment. For those who don't know, I mean, Augustine uh, was a North African um, uh, Roman, uh, Latin, probably of Berber stock, was raised Christian. Uh, he had a devoutly Christian mother and, an, you know, 
his relation with his father was different, but but you know his relations with his mother uh, uh, is, is you know profoundly and beautifully uh, described in the Confessions. He himself, uh, you know, early in youth, went his own way. He uh, at the age of seventeen uh, took a miss or a common law wife, let's say, uh, was the father of a son named Adeodatus, you know, the gift of God. He converted uh, for a while, for about nine, maybe even 10 years to Manichaeism, the sort of radical dualist, uh, a Persian, semi-Zoroastrian, semi-Gnostic, profoundly influential religious movement at its time, and then groped his way back to Christianity. And the Confessions lays all this out, not just in terms of a series of events, but in terms of, of the heart's longing for God and resistance to the call of grace. And in trying to understand how grace had worked in his life, uh, he ended up unfolding a world of interiority that just was not part of the literary consciousness of, and, and maybe not part of consciousness at all, in a sense. I mean, it disclosed a different way and there was always an inwardness to his approach to God. I mean, he always understood God as being dwelling at the, you know, to be found at the, at the highest heights of the mind and the, in the deepest depths of memory. God is always already there as the foundation of all. Uh, so, but it's not just the confessions. Understand all of his work is marked by an originality and genius and beauty of diction. Now, you said, you know, he strikes you as a troubled soul. And it's true. Many people read the Confessions and they find him a deeply attractive character just because of his candor and his honesty. And because he's describing perhaps passions and convulsions of the soul that are common to them. But others, you know, who are of a different cast of mind also find there a kind of troubling darkness or bleakness even a kind of neurosis at times. And I have to confess that I waver between the two. Sometimes I read the confessions and I'm swept away by the beauty of the language, the beauty of the, the, of the devotion. I mean, understand he was a master rhetorician as well. He was one of the most original prose writers of Latin. But there's also there, what from our perspective, what's someone with perhaps my, uh, I don't know, too, maybe I'm too phlegmatic by nature, <laughs> but for me, uh, to, it's true that I also come away at times finding his his personality deeply depressing, uh, as if there's something wrong there that that uh, converts joy into anguish as much as it converts ang as it's seeking to confess convert anxiety and fear into joy. Quite often, it goes both ways. Uh, and I do see that as, as also in some ways true of his theology uh, uh, in, in later years when he was an older man. Uh, and, but before we go, let me point out also, I mean, before we go on, let me just point out, um, he's also perfectly original and, you know, uh, I say his Latin, let me, uh, you know, the rhetorical norm for, for classical rhetoric, I mean, the, nor, the, the ideals, even up until the time of Augustine, was the cultivation of, the, of hypotactic complexity and eloquence that's, that's architectonic. You know, have all your subordinate clauses in the, in the right place. Use, use the subjunctive with sufficient subtlety and, uh, and nimbleness he, he mastered a style that's more paratactic, that's just flowing and flowing. And, and uh, you know, there, I don't think there's any Latin prose stylist who used the word and, you know, et or atque or whatever, et especially, more often than for Augustine because it just, and, and he could just carry you along. I mean, um, you know, uh, some of the most, well, I mean, just, you know, there are phrases in the confession, there are parts of the confessions that, that, that if you love the Latin language, you're as likely to memorize as you are the verse Aris or, or Catullus. So, you know, uh, 
serote amave poco tudo tamantico et tam nova, serote amave reque intus eras et eco fois, ibi te qua, uh, what is it? Qua rebam et in ista formosa qua fecisti, the formless, you know, too late have I loved you, beauty so ancient and so new, tam antique, tam nova, et tam nova, too late have I loved you. And see, you were within and I was without, and I sought you there and was rushing in my deformity among the beautiful things that you have made. You know, ista formosa qua fecisti. You were with me and I was not with you, you know. Uh, it, it's hard not to be drawn into, into the sheer beauty and passion. Well, it's a, it, you're right. And the, the, that flowing sense in the prose, I think, is not just... I've, I've lost you on the screen. There we are. Okay. My screen suddenly went blank. Yeah. The, the, the flowing sense of prose to which you've just alluded and explained, I think, as, uh, as you and I would both agree, is not just a stylistic feature. It's a, it's a liberation. Right mind his mind is is flowing and that makes it great great literature and and there are at least four of i mean he wrote an immense corpus of writing and all of it is marked by moments of beauty and moments of genius but i mean it's also as he gets older it's marked also by a more and more terrible vision to be honest of uh you know w w w there's a struggle going on in him in the confessions between faith and faithlessness between submission to something he believes and his unwillingness to submit to it. But what's going on in the later years is this struggle has been converted into a struggle that, that it's, I don't know what to call it. It's a struggle to see that beauty displayed in what looks like an ever darker construal of our existence as creatures, but also of the grace that supposedly comes to our aid. His last work of genius, and there, there are at least four works of his that I would say are, are just, you know, of shocking genius. One is the Confessions for its originality. One is De Trinitate, his treatise on the Trinity, which I think surpasses anything else in the patristic canon for subtlety and depth uh, in, in, in Trinitarian thought, even if, you know, not in you know, some you know, different, they're great Trinitarian thinkers in particular, but De Trinitate stands apart. His uh, commentary on Genesis, De Genesis and Literum, which is the literal reading of Genesis, but of course, I think, as you know, literal didn't mean in, in, in late antiquity what we mean by literal. It means attention to what the words on the page are saying before you go on and attempt a spiritual exegesis. And the city of God. And the city of God is like nothing else before it. It's 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 at once, uh, you know, a theology and a metaphysics, but also a political theory of considerable subtlety and originality, a political genealogy which had never been undertaken before. You know, why is it that human human society is constructed as it is? What are the foundations of it? What is you know how is how is most political order built upon an, a, a, an unyielding and, and, a, and an imperishable substrate of violence, of murder, of fratricide? Um, but it's also an anthropology in some ways, and, and and yet it's also probably the most systematic statement of a theology of grace, of predestination, of election. That were it true, I think, would convert existence into the most horrific cruelty that, that a malign deity could visit on these creatures. Well, and I don't know what to make of this. I don't know what to make of the sheer genius of this man in later years, still genius, but, but having for exegetical reasons, for polemic, for reasons of deba theological debate, having arrived at a picture that could not possibly be true, and that isn't actually what's there in the New Testament, although I know why he came to the conclusion that it was, but that he, with a mind as vast as his, and how he <laughs> could have believed some of the things he believed. And there, I guess, we return to personality, to temperament. Well, that's... I, you're right, something was wrong. And yeah, I, I, yeah. 
I mean, I, <laughs> I, I was uh, a, a, a teacher of literature in my first career. I mean, literature is my great love. And I can remember... <laughs> Mine as well. I mean, that's actually much more important to me than theology. <laughs> but, yeah. I can remember one of my bright students coming to me one day and, and with a troubled look on his face said, why are all the great writers so troubled? <laughs> that was, of course, a little bit of an exaggeration, but, but not too much. Um, no, it's, a... it's this sense of inquiry that the troubled soul gets driven to. Um, as you were talking, I thought, I was thinking, you know, uh, as you were talking about the confessions and, 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 and his access to his interior journey and his candour about it and his skill in unfolding it, I, I thought to myself, well, it really went in two, dire I mean, two directions. As you know far better than me, but, but um, what intrigues me a great deal is in, in De Trinitate is the way he looks at his own tripartite experience as an analogy of the Trinity. And um, um, he, he, he sees the image of God, our, our Trinitarian na nature imaging God. I mean, it's a magnificent, a magnificent section. Uh, by the way, which I, and this will take us off the mark, I was uh, in preparation for this reading again, that other dark-minded soul, far less, uh, in, far, far less expansive of intellect, Calvin, um, who explicitly uh, rejected his Trinitarian um, model, which was which uh, 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 which was uh, in an interesting aside to me. But leaving Calvin, that, Calvin Calvin had a, an absolute genius for adopting everything that was worst in Augustine and rejecting everything that was best. Yes, I think that's a fair. And, and, and by the way, I point out Calvin is another brilliant writer. I have to point out in the uh, in the 16th century, there's no better. Uh, stylist in latin and he's arguably the father of modern french prose so i hate to say it but yeah, yeah we'll get on but... he, yeah, he shared augustine's eloquence to some but, uh, not the beauty but always not the name latin but nonetheless yeah yeah but then there's this other side of augustine which you've talked about this uh as he got older he seemed to get crankier and this this dark side i mean i can remember when i was reading the city of god i haven't read the whole of it but i've re read a lot of it in preparation for my talks on hope and hell um and i as you would know came across this utterly disturbing um chapter on um eternal torment what was disturbing was the question he asked himself about it, which I thought, I, I, I was just hoping that uh, the modern atheists and critics of Christianity never find it because they'd find evidence for a sociopathic psychology there, where to him, the fact that suffering is eternal, I mean, if you look at that and ask what question does that raise for me, for most people, I think even for Calvin, it raised the question, well, this is awful. How does this align with the character of God? Which is not the question he asked. The question he asked was, how on earth um, normally suffering is has got an end to it? If I put my finger, you know, in the fire, it'll eventually I'll, I'll die um, eventually. So, how on earth then can something which seems to be fashioned to be um, bounded by time become eternal? That's that's a question, and and God in His wonder is going to answer this question for us. And I thought. I was just stunned at this almost takeover of a sociopathic, I mean, it was just like autistic in its sort of denial of feelings. What happens with, you know, I, I uh, as you know, um, a year and a half, two years ago, published a book on universalism, uh, the actual argument of which, not that you would know this from some of the reviews written, is, uh, is a very simple well not simple but a, a, a very orderly seven point argument that uh if christianity is true if there is a true form of if christianity if the it, it, the, the universalists like origin and gregory of this and isaac of syria syria got it right if they got it wrong then christianity is an incoherent system of belief now i expected of course controversy um but what was interesting was the only reviews of that book that actually followed any part of the argument accurately were the positive reviews the people who already agreed with me 
all the crit, I mean, I, and I mean every single one of them, all the critical reviews, even those by Thomists, putatively trained philosophers, one by a, well, a putatively trained Greek Orthodox philosopher who's actually quite bad, but anyway, nonetheless, others by, you know, Protestant, you know, even people of high education, every one of them, um, first of all, got the, 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 the argument completely wrong from beginning to end, completely misrepresented it. But also, again and again, what really struck me was how furious they were to be made to think about it. And because I think, you know, there's a psychology, I think everyone who, everyone knows that the notion of a hell of eternal torment is an abominable idea. It makes no sense within the context of the gospel as it's laid out. And they may not know that it's actually uh, alien to the language of the New Testament as it is, because they're used to the translations that seem to, to suggest otherwise. But they, but they know there's something wrong, but they believe they have to believe it. So they have reconciled their consciences to it to, so thoroughly that they, they're furious if, if, you, if you challenge them to think it through again from first principles, just in simple moral principles. And many of them have so thoroughly forced themselves to believe that it's good that they've come up with arguments that, that to them seem quite you know, reasonable now, but that from if anyone standing outside would say, well, this is, this is evidence of profound psychosis that you can believe this. One young Thomist philosopher, uh, so I don't want to talk about my book, but it was interesting to me. He was very much in the, um, the manualist Thomist tradition, and he argues you know, for the goodness of hell as an aesthetic reality, that it's a, the fullness of possible manifestations of divine glory, including his wrath against sin, are is made evident by this. And, and this is all right because the suffering of the damned is a purely private evil, but an objective good wow. as, as part of the pattern of the whole. Now, first of all, there's no such thing as a purely private evil. Anyone suffering is an objective fact, right? That that the the you know, the notion that uh, the, that someone's suffering is good because I'm standing outside of it, uh, uh, looking at it as part of a larger pattern that that pleases me is, in psychological terms, sadism. That's all it is, you know. Uh, but but this is another one. I mean, you see, this this probably is a psychologically normal and healthy person in most of his dealings with reality. And yet on this point, he has adopted a psychosis. And you have to wonder, what, he's what? I mean, this kid, again, he's, he's very big in, um, in, the, in the sort of uh, rad trad Thomas circles in this country. But what he's good at right now is young, is it parroting a system he's been taught? He's not. He's not a gifted thinker in his own right yet, but as he becomes one, he may find even more specious arguments supporting this evil idea because he believes it's required of him. Well, that, that was the what effect will that have on him by the time he's 60 or 70? What moral effect does yeah. that have ultimately when your image of God is that foul and yet you have to affirm that, that in fact, this is, this is the work of an infinitely good and loving God? Well, well to, to, you know, to that end, um, I did read recently uh, a letter, you would know it better than I, I think Augustine wrote to the Roman emperor in 417, asking for support in persecuting his religious enemies, the Donatists, in which um, it was a rather frightening letter in which he, he really was um, justifying Persecution. If you're, it, it isn't persecution. If the church is doing the persecuting, right? yeah. No, I mean that is basically. I mean, Augustine is is the founding father of uh, of holy violence in that sense. Persecuting. There were earlier examples of abuse, but there was no theory of it. Uh, and Augustine, yeah, late in life with the Donatists and others, and it, it makes perfect sense. If you, if bleak, if you, if you have this rather bleak vision of reality, 
you know, a very small contingent have been uh, predestined to eternal beatitude and the rest to, to eternal suffering. And your role in this life, you think, is, is simply to be, if, if, if you're pious enough, to be used by God to help usher those who've been predestined to salvation into the proper camp, <laughs> you know. Um, coercion, I mean, you know, all right. Um, you uh, use a bit of beating and violence and imprisonment in this life. Surely they're better. That's better off than than simply uh, um, abandoning these souls to eternal torment. But then again, you have to ask yourself, if you believe that, that coercion was a legitimate way of plucking the, the, the damned out of the fires of hell, that in itself should have told him that something was wrong with the, with the, with the premise from which he was starting. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that because, because if you're allowed to use violence, lesser violence to avert the greater violence of, of God's infinite vindictiveness, then the, your picture of God probably was uh, was somewhat amiss to begin with. And, and well, well, if we could just now, having I think you painted. Sorry, I, don't, I don't mean to wander all over the map here, but I mean. Well, but it's it's impossible. I I think given the sheer volume of Augustine's um, output and uh, um, the length of his life, and the fact that his output seemed to change and it's so paradoxical, such a mixture. Um, this, but this well, if, if he had died, say, 18 years earlier, we'd, we would not be having this conversation. Yeah, what a pity. Um, uh, so, but, but I'd like to move on now to his influence. Um, and, you know, just wonder, I mean, I, I mean, I'm very aware that his influence on the Reformation was dominant or monopolistic and certainly Luther and Calvin, particularly Calvin, he was virtually beside the New Testament. Could you trace his influence um, and why he, you know, just perhaps give us a bit of a... And, and within the Catholic world, Jansenism, you know, Jansenius was, uh, and, and even arguably um, the schools of Thomism of the 16th century and after uh, Banyes and Alvarez, the Catholic Church put a greater emphasis on the Augustinian side of, of Aquinas um, and the uh, uh, on issues of, of nature and grace, predestination, election, uh, and that sort of thing. So anyway, your question was sorry. I, I just, to... it, it, for people who don't know, um, what we've done is traced a picture of a complex character, um, uh, and I think the Confessions has the, almost the psychological seeds of everything in it: a great yearning for God, but then a dark, troubled side. Um, as he got older, um, he got crankier, and um, the dark side seemed to take over. Unfortunately, uh, now. The influence of this man was uh, uh, totally. huge. I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us a bit of a timeline or a bit of you know, why was he, where was he so influential? And then after. Well, I mean, understand that there simply was no one else comparable in the Western tradition. There just was no one who just towered over every area of Christian thought the way he did. But, it, but there had been contentions uh you know uh o over his legacy as to as to the issues of uh, of predestination of grace um after after soon after his death we have figures like uh you know, um say folk gentius of Uspensis and others who who uh are are very much hardliners of the of the late uh, augustinian synthesis uh, whose whose treatises are quite horrifying on these issues. You know, I remember uh, you may never have heard of Fulgentius. But he he uh, I remember once reading a treatise of his in which he 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 he, he um or a sermon, I can't remember which. This is back in my Cambridge days when I was uh, in my twenties. So um but uh he talks about uh two two children, right? Uh, one is a baby whose parents are Christians and they're, they're dashing to the baptismal font to have the baby baptized. The other is a pagan baby who's been stolen 
or something, I don't know, and take them to the baptismal font. Now, the Christian baby dies before he can be baptized. The pagan baby dies soon after being baptized. Maybe an inept priest drowned him in the font. The, the details have faded with the years because I never wanted to reread this, obviously. And Fulgentius points out, well, the pagan baby, through the uh, electing uh, will of God, of course, enters into eternal bliss because he's, he's been baptized, whereas the, the baby of the Christians died unbaptized and descends to eternal torment. And then he ends this with, um, you know, O quam inscrutabilia sunt judicia Dei. <laughs> oh, how inscrutable are the judgments of God, but, but how glorious, you know. And, and I thought, oh, good God. You know, this this is uh, this is this is the worst sort of horror film I've ever been made to watch. I don't know why the screen on my computer is changing colors on me. So forgive me if I if I turn occasionally corpse corpse color here. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, at the, but there were in the Carolingian period, um, for instance, the, the John Scotus Origina, Origina, the great Irish. Uh, uh, theologian and metaphysician, maybe, I mean, also one of the most brilliant minds in Christian history, and but much more neglected. Uh, before he wrote his own, he, and he read Greek, by the way, which gave him an advantage over Augustine. He first comes to our notice of being, you know, commissioned by, by the Carolingian court to produce uh, uh, a refutation of uh, of Gottschalk, Gottschalk or Gottesculp, depending how you, a, a, a theologian who's a strict late Augustinian. And Erigena uses Augustine against Augustine. He uses the early Augustine to argue that uh, against the hard double predestinarianism of the late Augustine. And it's fascinating. But you see these controversies have been running throughout Catholic history. And um, it wasn't a hard and settled thing that the, the, that the late Augustine theology in its full terrible splendor uh, would, would be the dominant theology of, of, of the Western church. Um, to be honest, uh, well into the high middle ages, there were still a great variety and diversity on, uh, on the way people thought about grace. They all revered and loved and honored Augustine, and, and they had some doctrine of predestination. But it certainly wasn't necessarily what we find in the late Augustine. But Aquinas ultimately adopted every bit as un, unyielding and, and, and uh, rigid or predestinarianism. And uh, Thomists will tell you that this isn't true, but it is true. Thomas is every bit as much a double predestinarian as Calvin. He's just uh, much more brilliant at making it sound like that's not what he's saying. But, um, uh, and from the high Middle Ages onward, uh, and in the next century, the 14th century, more and more, uh, what the August, I mean, Augustinian or Augustinian tradition uh, in, a, in, in a now modernized and even more severe form in, in, uh, began to uh, become a, a, one of the dominant strains. Of, uh, Luther comes out of an Augustinian monastic tradition. You know, he's uh, you know, familiar with the nominalist doctrines of absolute sovereignty, ideas that actually go beyond Augustine's much more careful and much more brilliant metaphysical um, uh, understanding of God and begin more and more to take the element of what looks like sheer arbitrariness in the God of the late Augustine and elevate that uh, to a virtue, to make it, you know, uh, to represent divine sovereignty, which now becomes the highest good. It, and there's a curious convergence between this way of thinking about God and the emerging political models of early modernity the absolute monarch, which is not a medieval idea, it's an early modern idea, the absolute prerogatives of the nation state. More and more, there's some sort of strange occult interchange going on between the picture of God as this absolute sovereign hidden behind uh, quite often the nominalist veil of, of absolute mystery, whose only dealing with his creatures is the pure power of his will to be, 
you know, sovereign, the sovereign uh, disposer of all things, and the image of the monarch as the absolute sovereign. And then by, you know, you could argue that the story of modernity has been more and more the migration of this understanding of what it is to be free, to be truly free, to be absolutely sovereign, to be just pure will, willing what it wills for the sake of what it wills, migrates from the image of God to the image of each individual. And that becomes our, our picture of, you know, the libertarian modern individual subject invested with absolute prerogatives uh, whose freedom consists in pure spontaneity of will, sovereignty over self. Um, how this happened, I mean, you know, you can see the genealogy of this picture of divine sovereignty and, and its effect both in political thought and, you know, and on are thinking about what it is to be a free rational creature from the late medieval period onward. But it's by a subterranean stream. This is a possibility in late medieval thought because it has always been latent in the tradition going back to the late Augustine. Because from the moment the late Augustine decides that the answer to the Pelagians is, you know, this story of absolute predestinatio anti provisum merit, which is one of his clear misreadings of Paul, that God predestines either to damnation or salvation entirely without any prevision of the merits of the creature, because those merits are in fact the effects of predestination, not 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 their 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 premise, not not their cause. From that moment onward. Uh, this this poison, um, I hate to say, it, is 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 present in the blood system of the West and of Christian of Christendom. And surely um, Calvin, of all people, um, institutionalized it um, and, and, and and took it. Well, first of all, theologically, he took it to a new extreme because he was willing, in Book Three of the Institutes, to say something that neither Augustine nor Aquinas would say, which was that God predestined the fall, right. right? So that the whole drama of fall, mortality, damnation, salvation, exists purely as, as, as the display of divine power, display of divine sovereignty. And Calvin's quite clear here, and sadly there's great precedent for this in the tradition, the rarity of grace, the fact that it's given to only very few, that the va and, and understand this is what the, the vast majority of humanity was created with no other purpose than to suffer eternity. The rarity of grace is what demonstrates its its preciousness, its its goodness. The it's uh, actually the, the truth is, it, it, if that were true, it would demonstrate a certain uh, uh, revolting evil in that grace but you know well it's, it's, it's a good thing that the new atheists don't, don't understand calvin very well they might have um, more room for some, of them, some of them do i mean some of them some of the i mean not not maybe the big four but some of them are are atheists precisely because this is they they the, the, the christian i mean i i've certainly met people who are drawn to the new atheists uh precisely because well, that's well, well, just take that further um because you've traced this uh, this influence um, misanthropic, dark influence, which comes from a vision of who God is, um, yeah. and um, I, an atheism. I, I mean, I have a pastoral concern about these matters, um, which uh, which is that privately, it's creating in many Christians, young Christians, a kind of a quiet atheism. Yeah. Um, if this is God, then I, I mean, I, when I, uh, I can't believe in him. When uh, I gave talks on hope and hell um, some time back on a, a, a very zealous young evangelical Christian who was uh, both zealous and literate um, was, uh, uh, let's say, converted to the blessedness of, you know, of cosmic redemption. And I asked him afterwards, I said, well, what effect has this had on you? And he paused for a long time, and then he said, "I've recovered my love for God." Um, oh yeah, no, I mean, I am. Um, 
look, I think, I mean, I think there's always been a problem in uh, developed Christian doctrine. Uh, with the, you know, obviously, I believe that the whole notion of eternal torment is an accident of ecclesial history, and I think, and I can give you any number of arguments for why it, it became the prominent, the, the, the predominant view. Uh, but, you know, for most of Christian history, most, most Christians were largely unacquainted with the details of something like the theology of grace you have in the late Augustine. It's only in early modernity when, when figures, you know, remember Calvin had, you know, one of the reasons why obviously Calvin is an influential figure is because the printing press existed. And I think more and more the theology as the 16th century, theology of the 16th century became more and more sort of militantly late Augustinian. And, and I want to point out again, in Catholicism too, not just in, in Reformation and Evangelic uh, circles, but in a lot of, of, of Roman Catholicism as well. It also was the first time that many Christians actually came to be acquainted with the full uh, with the full uh, contents of this theological and dogmatic tradition. Actually, if you, most medieval Christians, you know, have rather vague, you know, there's heaven, there's hell, there's the mother of God who will plead for us before, you know, her son, the judge, you know. It, it, uh, there's, you know, once a year you may, you, know, you may communicate if you're especially pious, if you're one of the peasants. There, there's not a strong consciousness of the theology uh, as a, a, a system of, of thought about God and God's relation to creation. In way, but in the early modern period, late medieval and the early modern period now, it becomes a matter of general consciousness. And that's the beginning of the end when the, the Augustinian tradition is dominant because you know, yeah, it, 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 all of these movements, the Reformed Church, Lutheranism, they, they had, you know, at first, they're marked by great vitality. But all these modern expressions of Christianity more and more begin to sink into a kind of morbidity uh, because as people become aware of the full, the full spectrum of this kind of late Augustinian theology, a great many of them see how repellent it is. Now, at first, this will take the form of, you know, attempts to rescue other kinds of Christianity from, from historical forgetfulness. Like, you know, John Wesley was a great reader of the fathers and the Greek fathers, and uh, he rejected out of hand this picture. So the, the Methodist tradition stands outside. There were huge movements of, of universalism in 19th century Britain. I mean, it, it scarcely, or not just in Britain, I, I, I just mentioned that because I was about to say, but throughout the Christian world, Russia too. Uh, but if you just look at, you know, you think of, of Britain in the 19th century, the, the, the sheer number of, of prominent figures who were believers, like say the Brontes, Lewis Carroll, <laughs> George MacDonald, you know, of course, is most explicitly so Tennyson, you know, you go down the list of, of people with enough, you know, who are devout, but with enough sensitivity and intellectual tact to see, uh, to be genuinely horrified uh, by the picture they've been pre presented. But then, of course, what, what, what also happens is that more and more at a very tacit, very quiet level, more and more people are driven away from this picture. You know, I, I, the, the, the late modern picture of God that became dominant, the, the sort of the, the voluntarist God of absolute sovereignty, who is rooted in late Augustine, uh, in the late Augustine theology, is two things at once. He becomes the model of freedom as such, pure sovereignty. So he becomes a rival to each of us, an intolerable rival. He's also a tyrant. And for both those reasons, he has to be killed. You know, modernity, we discover our liberty by killing the 
ancient omnipotent rival to our liberty. You know, uh, the, the only one who can be sovereign uh, in, our, uh, in a way that leaves us uh, subordinate to him. But also, he's a tyrant. You know, he, he, you cannot believe, you cannot love this God. And you should not, and he, he must and he must die. And so by the time we get to the late 19th century and Nietzsche's proclaiming the death of God and, and giving it a genealogy, that's rather brilliant, but one thing he's leaving out, one thing he leaves out is the degree to which the age, the, the death of God, the birth of, of modern atheism, the fragmentation of the Christian view of reality is something incubated within late medieval and early modern Christianity itself. So to just pause there, because you've taken us on a Gideon tour, but a very important one, <laughs> um, that the uh, adoption of the view of God implicit in late Augustine that got hardwired in early modern Christianity by Calvin and others, this view of God as, I think you said, tyrant, um, and then what was the other? But don't keep putting all the burden on Calvin, also by Banyes and Alvarez, and you know, that tradition of Catholicism, John of St. Thomas, Billuart, or the Jansenists, the hard Augustinians, the non-Thomas Augustinians too. Yeah, and the view of God. And Luther. Yeah. And Luther, yeah. But this view of God, just, just to, can you just uh, repeat what you said about the, the implicit view of God? I mean, what, on the one hand, tyrant, on the other hand. Rival. Uh, rival. Well, again, this this picture, you know, what is freedom? Okay. It, in the pre-modern picture of, of God's freedom and our freedom, freedom is the ability to fulfill your nature in the in the good. God is incapable of sin, for instance, because he's infinitely free. You know, he's already, you know, he's perfectly united with the goodness that he is. Yep. Uh, we are free to the degree that we 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 uh, are so that our nature is fulfilled in the good for which we were created, and that alone can make us happy and fulfilled. And you know, more and more in this late medieval picture, for various reasons, the idea of freedom now comes to be the power of the will to express itself spontaneously with indifference to any prior transcendental inclination to the good. We fulfill our nature not in union with with the good, but but in 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 absolute uh, unbounded the power of ex, uh, uh, of will and the about the ability to express it. Now, at first, only God enjoys that liberty, but that becomes the model of liberty, right? It becomes the model of the power of kings, but it also ultimately becomes the the model of the sovereign individual. Uh, if I'm going to be a free man. Okay, God is now my rival because because you know I'm not my, my freedom isn't a participation in His infinite intentionality of the good to the good. If I can't participate, He's just absolute sovereign power, and I'm sovereign power, and the only way I can really exercise my sovereign power without being His slave is to banish Him from the horizon of of reality, to cease to believe in Him, to do away with Him. I now, if that's God, then to be free, I must displace God. Uh, got it. Now, uh, to be free, I participate in God. You know, I, I, I am set free from, my, from the finitude and, and imperfection of my desire by being reoriented to the one good that God is by sharing in the divine life as imparted to me through the Holy Spirit of Christ. That's a very different model. But this picture of, of freedom, this picture of God's freedom as just pure sovereignty behind a veil. Remember, what the voluntarist and nominalist picture of God says is that really God could have, you know, we, we, did not, we know nothing about any ultimate goodness as such. God could just as well, given his absolute power, have decreed that murder and rape are good and that love and compassion are not. It's his power that makes him God, not, not his goodness. The goodness is, is a subordinate reality. It's the power that makes him God. Okay, that's a perverse picture, but that is the one that begins to take shape in the late, in certain late medieval circles. 
and it becomes impiety to say otherwise for someone to say that God must be good, you know, in, in this way or in that. So in that way, that's not a good, that's not a freedom one can participate in. That's a freedom that one uh, can imitate only by, by, uh, by antagonism, you know, by, tr by trying to take its place. Now, an antagonism is my freedom. Um, right. And, now, on the other hand, uh, putting aside that, the issue of the, the, the sort of the, the agon between my little desire, my, my small local finite desire to be sovereign unto myself and, and this intolerable rivalry that God now represents to me. On the other hand, if I have a conscience, okay, this picture of God offends me for a different reason, not because God's my rival, but but simply because God is a spectacularly evil tyrant, one who just arbitrarily condemns most of his children to eternal torment just to prove he can do it. That's the whole point. I mean, you know, Calvin's very clear on this. It's all to display his sovereignty. And that's important enough. You know, I think in the, my book, I, 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 I mentioned the story that Suetonius, the, his, the Roman historian, tells about Domitian, who... Uh, I don't know, just as a lark, invited his steward, one of his stewards, into his private apartments to share dinner with him and, and eat from his royal his own plates, you know, to recline on an imperial on a couch of the emperor. And then the ne and of course this is the greatest honor the steward could have imagined. And then the next morning, Domitian ordered the steward to be crucified. Now that is a wonderful display of absolute dispositive sovereignty. Yeah. He is just for those to whom he is gracious and he is you know uh, cruel to those to whom he chooses to be cruel and it's purely in his hands whom he elects and whom he leaves derelict the god of early modernity the god of calvin the god who by a, a a long but nonetheless unbroken subterranean uh genealogy goes back to the late augustine is an omnipotent demission. Yeah, and a, 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 another side effect of, of the picture of freedom that you're painting that occurred to me is that it, it is intrinsically fragmentary. It will fragment the whole world into individual yeah. worlds. In, into an infinite plurality of sovereignties sealed in themselves, seeking only their own ends. Which freedom, freedom then becomes a war of all against all. Which, which immediately, of course, contrasts with where we, one of the points that we uh, explored in Gregory was his sense of the commonality of humanity in one um, community. Um, now, the funny thing is, the early Augustine, you could say that of most of Augustine's life. I mean, Augustine believed, that's the funny thing, this is why, why Augustine is such a problem for me, because this late theology is so, inconsonant with what he knew already about his faith and about his humanity. I mean, Augustine cared deeply about the poor. Augustine hated slavery too, although unlike Gregory, he didn't have the, he didn't imagine that you, that, that, that you could attack the, the very foundations of the institution, but he, he tried to ameliorate, he tried to convince people to free their slaves. He uh, tried to ameliorate the condition. If, if he had had his way, there had been no child selling of children in slavery, but the reason that was allowed was often because the alternative was exposure, you know, the babies left to die. So on the other hand, then there was this other side of his nature where he'd say, well, but of course it's, uh, you know, if you have to chastise your slaves in order, you know, it's good for them to beat them, you know, because they'll help them get to heaven, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, he was, he's such a, he's such a, a uh, collection of contradictions, but it, it is true. You bring up Gregory. It is a, you know, to me more and more. It, these are the two visions we have now. Gregory represents a vision that's shared with others, like Origen. He's not the sole architect of this picture. To me, he's just the one who gives us. Uh, through uh, and maybe it comes, and also even then, coming largely from his sister. I mean, you know, um, but he gives us a picture of Paul's teachings in the New Testament that's thoroughly coherent, that, in which nothing is explained away, which is radiant 
with the highest imaginable hope and joy that says this really is good news, the gospel. I mean, you, you, uh, uh, call it an evangelion is not a bad joke. What we get from the late Augustine onward, if that's good news, you know, you, you, God, 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 spare us bad news because it, you can't imagine how it could be much worse. You know, almost everyone's going to suffer forever, and they never had a chance really of not suffering because it's only the predestining will of God. And then, of course, by the time you get to Calvin, God predestined even the fall. So there's absolutely no contingency in this picture. If that's the gospel, may Christianity die. Yes, I, I, evil creed. Am I wrong to uh, speculate that there's something beautifully feminine about the Gre Gregory's theology? I mean, it was so influenced by his sister, his mother. I mean, they were a family that seemed to have a beautiful balance. I, I, I tend to think, uh, you know, I tend to think women are, are, are probably better than men in general. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll go with that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm to this point in my life where I, I'm thinking, where I think the priesthood should be limited only to women, you know, because I don't trust men to be capable of spiritual uh, wisdom. I, I, uh, I, it has something to do with, with age and with uh, continual disappointments with the people who do wield ecclesial power. Yes. But I'm still waiting for the, for the first incarnation of the first matriarch of Constantinople. Uh, but yeah, okay. Putting all that aside, uh, right. yeah, okay. that's fine with me. I, 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 I mean, the Greek part of the empire was more civilized in general, and as, and part of that was that, that actually the intellectual and spiritual life of women and was held in higher higher esteem in places like Alexandria and Constantinople. It just was. I mean, it's that you there are figures like well, you know, like Hypatia, of course, she's killed by bunch of christian thugs the parabolani because but but that was more common in the east anyway um even though it was still an age of obvious division of labor and patriarchy and all that um uh you find you know like basil of caesarea and great you know others of the eastern fathers just stating you know there's no difference in dignity women and men of the same intellect the same glory same grand you know and uh um, and so it's not a, it's not surprising. Gregory obviously feels no self consciousness in naming Macrino as his great teacher. Yeah. Um, but if you'd like to see that also something you know about, about the sexes to say that there's sort of like a superior sensitivity to what grace and goodness and kindness uh, and and mercy look like on the side of women than men. I'm I think most of human history would would give you some evidence to work with on that score. Yeah. But thank you. Um, well, look, to, to the last section of what's been a, a illuminating, I think, important conversation um, is, is let's move back to Gregory um, and, and focus on him. Um, and obviously, they didn't know each other, although they lived within a generation of each other, Augustine and Gregory. Is there any sign that they ever read or knew anything of each other? Well, I think, I mean, uh, through Ambrose, uh, Augustine was aware of the theology of the Cappadocian fathers uh, to some degree. I mean, he, he would have, his actual Trinitarian theology is very close to that of the Cappadocians, despite a generation of Greek polemicists who used to try to claim otherwise. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we don't know what he would have known of the Cappadocian literature, because he's born in 354, which is about 40 years before Gregory of Nyssa disappears. So just as he was coming into his adulthood, uh, Gregory is well into the later part of his intellectual career. Uh, of course, they have the printing press, and, and Augustine never learned to read Greek. But as I say, Ambrose did. And Ambrose was, was hugely influential on Augustine's theology. And I think through him, mediated much of the Eastern theology. And in, you know, it's in the city of God, when, when, great, when Augustine uh, criticizes, well, Origen cr criticizes those he calls the misericordes, the universalists, the he's clearly- The softies, hmm? the, the soft hearted. Right, the, the, the soft hearted, the kind hearted, yeah. Which apparently is a term of opprobrium <laughs> by that point in, in Augustine's career, sadly. As, in fact, 
it's it's odd in the passage on the Misericordes, if my memory is, is serves me well, uh, he finds it bizarre that uh, that 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 the universalists believe that even pagans and unbelievers and and it's like most preposterously of all, it seems for him, unbaptized babies uh, who die can be saved. Well, for... Of course, Gregory wrote um, the treatise on babies who die uh, prematurely. And by prematurely, I mean, he's talking about stillbirths, right? Now. So he means before baptism as well as not growing into adulthood. And of course, for him, they all are joined to God and grow in eternity. In, into God uh, and are saved, you know. Uh, and so it's a, a De Infantibus qui primatoria reptis or whatever, how it's, that's in the, uh, in the official Gregory Nisene opera edition. So, but, so with Augustine, you know, it's just quite the opposite. As I told you the story from Paul Gensius, the baby dies before reaching the font and it's just uh, too bad for him. And then, so, so can you help us with and and, and 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 one last thing I have to say. Just let's be honest about it. At least um, in the high medieval picture, and maybe in Thomas, although the things on this issue on limbo were written up, I think, but in his corpus, not written by him himself. But the notion that uh, you know they come to believe that unbaptized the babies who died unbaptized could. You know, would enter into the limbus infanti and the limbo of infants, maybe, and therefore enjoy perfect natural beatitude, though they would be denied ultimate union with God, ultimate vision of the divine of God. For Augustine and the Augustinian tradition, you no, know, uh, the unbaptized babies they they suffer the, the torments of hell. You know, maybe not as grave as the torments of confirmed sinners but you know the fires of hell uh, for eternity well in conclusion uh, let's just finish that was a cheerful note cheerful. Let, let's finish cheerfully uh gregory his how would i mean i think it's pretty obvious the answer to this is pretty obvious i was going to say how would the world have been different if for 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 if in a speculation and fantasy we imagined that the western christian mind had been influenced by Gregory rather than Augustine? I mean, what vision of God would, would we have? Well, certainly rather than the late Augustine. Than the late And, and uh, although on certain age, uh, things like original sin and the late Augustine is not necessarily all that late. He starts a period, you know, but, um, well, you know, I think, um, now, obviously, from my point of view, things would be much better. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think the whole late Augustinian tradition is not only an exegetical error, but uh, but obviously a, a moral scandal. And I think Christendom, Christianity, as a as a, as a plausible cultural force, might have survived. Uh, you know, I don't know if we would have, we would have, you know, uh, it, it, his historical contingencies are impossible to imagine counterfactuals. It's, it are, you know, it's a dangerous game to play. But as I said, the fragmentation of Christianity and of Christendom and of Christian culture in the modern age, I believe, is the result of certain inherent tensions in the history of Christendom. One of them is just the tension between gospel, you know, the, the gospel and the empire. I mean, this, this union was always a volatile and improbable mixture of, of contrary principles. But there were the other contradictions that were intrinsic to the tradition itself. One, trying to square the notion of, of the hell of eternal torment with all the other claims made about the love and goodness of God in Christ. And the other, uh, the contradiction, uh, well, the contradictions we've been talking about uh, between the, the, this picture of divine sovereignty and, and 
and and the human and what that then becomes of the human being in the light of that picture and, and the tension and antagonism this creates. Without that late Augustinian tradition, those later tensions, those later contradictions might not be there. Now, Augustine did not invent the idea of an eternal hell. I, I wish you could you could pin the blame for that on one person. And as long as that was the majority teaching, I believe Christianity was destined to be a self-consuming and, uh, and in, uh, you know, cultural reality. But definitely it's made immeasurably worse by doctrines of double predestination and inherited guilt and all the things that, that flowered fully in early modernity in the reformed and Lutheran and even Catholic churches and vast parts of it. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'd like to imagine there could have been an alternative Christendom or Christian order, Origenian, Nissanian, what have you. Well, I, I, I and you've already alluded to this, that uh, what you've seen is a strange but understandable alliance between the rise of atheism with Nietzsche and others, the rejection of God and the picture of God they were getting, which, yeah. um, and whereas I think the, the blessed picture of, of God who rooted not in power, but in love is a much more attractive, much more intellectually coherent, much harder to reject. Um, and, and remember the story of salvation essentially in Gregory and origin really is that that we're prisoners of death. If there is a hell, it's a hell we've created and are creating. And the divine intention towards us is nothing but setting us free from that. It's a story of rest, conquering the powers that hold us in thrall, setting us free, invading even the depths of hell to break open uh, the prison in which we've inured ourselves. And that, that picture of God is, as you say, coherent, cogent, and even if you believe then that there's a possibility of eternal laws. Now, if there are other reasons why I believe this remains an incoherent idea, but even if you believe that as simply as, you know, creatures having the power to reject the salvation that God is trying to work on their behalf, there is no contradiction now in the picture of God. There is no point at which the son and the father somehow become polarity, a polarity in the faith, you know, the son who's saving us from the wrath of the father, because let's be honest, in that other picture, you can say that Jesus came to save us from sin, death, and the devil, but, but, but the, what, the, what the actual theology is saying is Jesus came to save us from God, the father, you know, from the judgment of God. And yeah, I think that the, the, that, that sort of psychotic division deep in the mind, in the consciousness of Christianity, would not have been there and a uh, very different uh, social and cultural reality would have arisen out of that, the union of that theology with the late antique Greco-Roman culture. If I can remember having a conversation with one of the uh, bright young friends of one of my children who was a skeptic and, uh, but he admired my faith and was intrigued by it because it was faith mixed with uh, what he recognized in me as a thinking person. And um, he, we were at a party one night and he was leaving, said goodbye to me, thanked me for saying grace or something. And um, then he awkwardly wanted to say how he had these arguments with Christians that he, he didn't need to be a person of faith uh, in order to have a conscience. And uh, whereas they were claiming that really that was the, um, Pro, uh, the intellectual property of Christianity, and and um, he re, he he resented that, and and he went on, and I said, well, look, well I, with good reason, I, I would I would hope he would resent it. <laughs> I said to him, um, uh, which you know maybe he 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 was startled. I said, I agree with you. I said, actually, I agree with you. I said, it's not not the problem. Um, I said, look, let's talk about the problem that Christianity primarily addresses. Let's go and find a graveyard. Let's go and sit on some gravestones and let's talk about how a man went out the other side of death and brought life to all. And he was just stunned. Now, that was a proposition he hadn't considered, where death is the enemy. Yeah. Death 
prison we're in. I mean, this is one of the peculiarities of Christian history. I mean, it starts with a very, uh, what's Paul really talking about is, a, is an epic story of the conquest of the archons, the powers, of the, the gods of the nation, who are, uh, may not even be fully fallen in the sense we think of just sort of inept in the, the, the conquest of the, the subterranean powers, the conquest of death all in order to set creation free so that there'll be a new age in which all of creation will be set free from the birth pangs you know, so of, this, of this final creation. Um, and in that story, as Paul teaches it, to, as Paul tells it, uh, God is, is, you know, is, is acting toward one end, you know, father, son, is acting towards the liberation of creation from slavery to death. And yet, vast portions of later Christianity invoking poor Paul as, as their source for this ridiculous theology actually transform it into a story, whether they want to say it or not, in which basically it's all a setup deal in which God has placed us in an impossible game that we can't win. Then he... Uh, chooses a few winners and even then the, the, those winners uh the prize they get is to be delivered from the arbitrary wrath of the fellow who created them this is such a bizarre uh inversion of the language of the new testament such a such a twisting out of shape that it's amazing to me that christianity survived at all in vast portions of what became christendom because by all rights the sheer absurdity of the picture that was created by this, this reversal of, of dramatis personae, if nothing else, uh, should have led to, to the eclipse of, of the faith. You know, maybe it was just imperial authority in many parts of the, of the world propping it up. Um, it, is, it is baffling how what really does sound like a very happy story. <laughs> <laughs> like very good news uh just you know maybe by by nature human beings really don't don't believe good news I mean, well i think that's where i began um you know that's what i've observed about us so perhaps that explains it i mean i was going to ask uh why you know why on earth didn't gregory uh, and and others but get that kind of influence in western christianity well again i mean you just the, the contingency they Augustine has no rivals for sheer genius in the West, no rivals for influence in time. And then the Western half of the empire, remember, remained, I mean, even though old Rome fell and Byzantium was a splendid capital for many centuries thereafter, ultimately it's the Western tradition that created the modern world because uh, the Eastern, the Eastern Christian world had to contend with the reality of, of Islam, not just as in the West and Iberia and Spain, but you know, uh, right up uh, uh, to the fall of Constantinople. Whereas with the uh, with the uh, Reconquista in Spain, the beginning of the age of exploration, colonialism, what have you suddenly Western European Christianity became global Christianity and ultimately you know, the dominant force in the world. Already the growing power in the high Middle Ages now became the first true. If you, however, in the 13th century, if you had frozen history just before the 13th century and, and mapped the Christian world, and said, you know, what is, what, what's the largest Christian communion in terms of geographical spread, it would have been the East Syrian tradition, the so-called Nestorian church, it's not a very good name, the East Syrian church, which spread from China through Central Asia, Persia, Syria. They fell on hard times. The Ming dynasty came to power, expelled the Mongols, expelled the foreign religion, Central Asia, uh, uh, the rise of Timor Lane led to the, you know, extermination of lots of Christian communities. That became the Byzantine Christianity fell ultimately to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, you know, Slavic Christianity was powerful in its own sphere for a while, but in its own sphere, and of course, 
than in the modern age uh, under communist uh, dictatorships. But from the late Middle Ages onward, the Western European Christianity, which at that, had, at that moment, that earlier frozen moment, was been actually a rather geographically rather small portion of uh, a sort of geological apophysis of, of the Asian world, <laughs> became, you know, uh, and, and you know, and, and it was it was also a great you know, intellectual cultural synthesis that occurred in Western, in, in, in the high middle ages. It wasn't just the Latin genius, it was everything they had drawn from Greco-Roman antiquity, from the Byzantine world, um, from influences of, of Muslim civilization, of, um, Jewish thought, from more distant influences that had made their way along the spice roads into Eastern Christianity and then into the West. With the fall of Constantinople, much of the riches of that tradition. Also, you know, the Florentine Academy in, in Italy comes into existence mostly because of all these displaced Byzantines, you know, people like uh, Bizarrian and others. Um, so, Western Christianity created the modern world. And yet, curiously, modernity is in many respects, the progressive negation of, of Christian belief. Well, uh, on that sobering note, um, uh, we might as well... History has its, 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 its ironies. History has its ironies. And um, uh, in closing, um, I would recommend, you know, for people who've listened, um, I... I, I I reread uh, that short but magnificent sermon by Gregory recently on Ecclesiastes, yeah, uh, on the abolition of slavery. And I think if if people listening want to do nothing else, they should Google it and read it. It's only a page or so, because this blessed vision that we've talked about of um, the love of God and the every human being made in God's image, um, which, which as we've explored was so fully developed and monopolized the mind of Gregory. Uh, this blessed vision was almost necessary for him to have the courage to advocate something like the abolition of slavery. And it's a, you know, it's just a magnificent piece of prose that if people wanted to get in a very um, crystalline one-page form, um, the full sweep from a blessed vision to a blessed social vision, it, I think it's a, it's a good place to start. I, I think, let me just say this before you go. I think the most, one of the most crucial moments in the political history of the West was the condemnation, the retroactive condemnation of origin under Justinian. And with him implicitly, now this wasn't a conciliar thing, but it was written into the 15th American Council after the fact. With him implicitly, all those aspects of, of origins theology that had been carried on in Gregory and others. I think that was a that that actually defined not only the theology of the future, but to a great degree the social and political vision that would triumph in an obscure way, but in a ultimately a very consequential way. Well, I'm glad you've mentioned that because I was going to ask you, and I think it is important, let's finish with it. Can you just quickly explain what happened? It was Justinian, um, who he seemed a dark, dark despot in, uh, for whom the doctrine of hell was extremely useful. He was a thug, but you know, he had talents, but you know, they were all thugs to be honest. All of them, there were no saintly uh, Christian emperors. To speak of. Uh, um, more as a matter of imperial power and imperial policy, he wanted to extinguish certain movements, aberrant movements in the monastic hinterlands uh, that, uh, that were associated, I mean, later associated in people's minds with the teachings of Vagrius Ponticus and threw him back to origin. Vagrius is a fourth century genius, one of the great masters of the Christian spiritual life. Uh, although 
the details of what they believed, if, if one is to believe the accounts that were then Ill illicitly, illegitimately added to the canons, to the records of the, of the Fifth Ecumenical Council, um, uh, make it seem that what they believe really had nothing to do with what Origen or Evagrius taught, but it doesn't matter. This became in Christian memory, the official condemnation of Origen. Now, first of all, Origen died a martyr in the peace of the church. So the notion that you could condemn such a man as a, you know, centuries after his death, it's just, you know, it's, it's abysmal nonsense. There's no provision of canonical law that makes that a legitimate decision. But um, also uh, it, uh, it, what it did was it hardened into the consciousness of Christians, East and West, the notion that somehow it was origins universalism, it was the idea and uh, that that had been condemned. And with that condemnation, you know, uh, implicitly comes a whole a whole um, a whole culture, theological culture of Origenian theology, which had been robust and real and had formed the Cappadocians. And it's still present after that condemnation of figures like Maximus the Confessor, who have to be very careful about expressing it, you know. And uh, it's one of the great tragedies of church history, not just because it's a great injustice against the first of the, the great fathers, and really the one who is the is the father of all the other fathers in terms of almost every aspect of Christian intellectual life. But also because I think it fundamentally distorted, deformed, and corrupted Christian self-understanding and and what was theologically licit for Christian culture. And I think it had cultural, social, and political ramifications that are far wider and deeper than we always fully appreciate. A church that condemned origin was already a church on the way to some fairly drastically unfortunate developments. And the culture built that that church governed had, had at that point been deprived to a very real degree of the deepest and profound, the, the most beautiful theological synthesis that Christian thought had ever known. And just to be clear for our listeners, which you could emphasize that it was the, these anathemas, as we're talking, is it 597 AD or 598 or something like that? The, these anathemas were very much the hand of Justinian the emperor, rather. Yeah. Than the, yeah, the, bl the blithering idiot Justinian uh, had them in, and they weren't, no one at the council actually discussed it. We know, I mean, this is just the fact that people who deny it, deny it because they're, they're fideists of a certain way. This was not even the topic of the council. The council was dealing with certain Assyrian theologians of the school of Antioch that would, you know, not not an Alexandrian like origin. Uh, this was this was a, um, a hobby horse of Justinians, and it was inserted into the records of the council afterwards, even though there is no. And since it wasn't actually part of the real council, it has no doctrinal legitimacy. If you're going to be honest, but not that I care. But I mean, it's you know, but it, but it was a lie. Uh, and it was the work of this dolt, Justinian, Saint Justinian. There's another irony of history is how many of these, these, these uh, thuggish little monsters got canonized while Origen to this day is not officially a saint of the church. And yet, but for Origen, there would not be a Christian tradition, intellectual, spiritual, whatever. Um, well, I mean, as we've been talking, David, I've been searching for a nice, elegant uh, way to close the conversation. And since it's so interesting, I don't think I'm going to find one. Um, well, let's just end it. <laughs> let's just end it. It's uh, uh, end it with... Uh, Bye. Okay. Sorry? Bye. It's just going to hang up on you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people uh, ha uh, will enjoy and have enjoyed these conversations. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I hope it was coherent. Thank you, and uh, uh, have a have a have a nice day there in, in Australia. It's going to be bedtime here soon. So, all right, bye bye, bye.